We'll be speaking with him in just a few minutes. But first, the three biggest stories of 2020, in my opinion, was the COVID-19 pandemic, the election between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and the censorship of those who have concerns or questions relating to those events. These events have one thing in common. All of the facts have yet to come out. In fact, all of the questions have not even been asked. In some, in some cases, the questions are not even allowed to be asked. Why? Many Americans have a lot of questions. I know I do. We as a nation must be able to freely investigate facts without threats of censorship or loss of income or reputation by simply asking questions or reporting on controversial issues. Until free speech and freedom of the press are restored and investigations are allowed to be completed in an unbiased and open format, millions of Americans will be will be feeling that they cannot trust our elected leaders, our elections, or our system of government. And those things are essential for a free nation to survive. Recently, Washington Post columnist Josh Rogan just did an interview with Megyn Kelly, and he's asking many questions about Dr. Fauci's connection with the Wuhan lab. Now, Fauci has been a big leader in a field called gain of function research. For those who don't know what that is, it's relating to the transmission and mutation of pathogens. But China's Wuhan Institute of Virology received funds from the NA, NIAID, the National Allergies and Infectious Disease Organization, which is overseen by guess who? Fauci. It's now known that scientists are afraid to speak out or ask any questions about this. So during the interview, Josh Rogan said the following. He said, I often talk to scientists who say the same thing. They say, listen, we really want to speak out about this, but we can't do it. Why can't we do it? Well, we get all of our funding from NIH and NIAID, which is run by Dr. Fauci. And so we can't say anything like, oh, gain of function research might be dangerous, or it might have come from the lab because we're gonna lose our careers, we're gonna lose our funding, and then we won't be able to do our work. So I have a lot of questions. Did the research get out of hand in the Chinese lab? And how was Dr. Fauci connected to that research? Were we misled by masks, the value of masks? Masks in the beginning were worthless, then masks are essential. Now there are reports going back that they're worthless. When are we going to achieve immunity? What is the number? What are the origins of this pandemic? Why, and this is something that was really important to me, why were more therapeutic medications such as remdesivir, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine and others not used and brought to the market earlier to help save lives instead of just locking us all done when we had medicines that could have helped? Why were the nursing homes forced to accept infected patients? And why was that covered up by the Emmy Award winner, Governor Cuomo? Why was testing not used around people crossing state lines? Why did Biden come out against stopping travel from China early on? Why have allegations of fraud, the signed affidavits from everyday citizens regarding the 2020 election, never been investigated? And no, the courts have not heard the evidence they most re have ruled on legal standing. Listen, if we can use a tape measure to measure the Super Bowl and have 20 different angles to determine the accuracies of referees' calls, why can't we review the 2020 election and have the questions that the American people are asking reviewed? Why has Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Google all have been able to get away with censorship in a free society? So I have many, 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 many more questions, more than we have time for in my brief opening remarks. But I know that both Mitch and I will continue to ask tough questions and bring up issues that are important to all of you. So again, thank you all for being here. And now I would like to introduce my good friend and fellow JRA co-founder, Mitch Silberman. Mitch. Hello, JRA community. 
It is always so great when we are together. So there's an old joke that goes like this. Two coworkers decide to have lunch together. So they grab their lunch bags, they go to the cafeteria, they sit down. First guy reaches in, takes out a sandwich and looks at it and says, dang, tuna again. I hate tuna. The second guy says, well, who makes your lunch every day? First guy says, I do. Now, the reason that's relevant today is because invariably you're going to have a family or a family member or a friend that says to you, can you believe how expensive gas has gotten? Or wow, my taxes really went up. Or can you believe the chaos at the border if they even know about it? And you're going to look at them and say, who did you vote for? Now, I'll submit to you, there's a better question to ask, which is what did you vote for? Because if you say who, they go to orange man bad for whatever reason. So you can ask, what did you vote for? And as I've said before, don't bother engaging with the far left. There's just no point. But I guarantee that you have people in your life that are good, decent, wonderful people that vote Democrat. With them, you must engage. And the three rules I have are this. Number one, ask a lot of questions. Number two, know your stuff. And number three, critical, be respectful. So if it comes up and they say, wow, gas has gone up or taxes have gone up and you feel it's, it's okay to engage with them, you can say to them, well, you know, what did you vote for? Because may I share with you what I think you voted for? Whether you realize it or not, you did vote for higher taxes. You did vote for gas to go up. You did vote for energy dependence. You voted for open borders. You voted for chaos in the Middle East. These are things that you voted for. And may I share with you what I voted for? What I voted for was border security. What I voted for is reasonable taxes and regulation. They always think we want no taxes, no regulations. I'm saying I voted for reasonable taxes and regulations. I voted for uh, making America, putting America first, putting Americans first. I voted for supporting Israel. I voted for Middle East peace. You can make a long list and you can say these things to them. Now, wouldn't it be great if they said, wow, you're right, I'm a Republican. But we all know it doesn't work that way, does it? However, you must engage, it's crucial. In fact, about 27 years ago, my dear friend, Mark Widower, one of the producers of the show, he did that to me. He asked me, have you ever listened to Dennis Prager? And I said, no, who's that? Well, that changed my mind and my life. And I'd like to think that through the JRA, I've changed some minds, maybe some lives. And I'll leave you with this story. An old man goes for a walk on the beach after a big storm has passed. That day, the beach was littered with starfish. From a distance, the old man spotted a little boy picking something up and putting it back into the sea, doing it over and over again. The man asked the boy what he was doing. The boy replied that he was returning the starfish back into the ocean. He said that if they were left there on the beach, they would die when the sun got high. To this, the old man replied, there are thousands of starfish on the beach. You won't make much difference, he said. The boy picked up another starfish, put it back into the sea, smiling. He then turned to the old man and said, I made a difference to that one. So I was that starfish that Mark asked, have you heard of Dennis Prager? There are a lot of starfish out there that you can and must make a difference for to help create the future you and your family deserve. And now, it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker today. I'm so excited to have Tim Clementi on. As an FBI counter-terror agent, SWAT team leader, and expert interrogator, Tim has worked all over the world in many of the highest profile cases of recent FBI history. Tim has parlayed his extraordinary life experiences into a career providing expert commentary on a broad spectrum of topics to multiple print, radio, and TV news programs, including CBS, ABC, Fox, CNN, Reuters, BBC, The Blaze TV, and even Al Jazeera America. Tim has established himself as a writer and creative consultant, working on several primetime network TV dramas and feature films. Tim, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mitch. My pleasure. It's, uh, it was a great uh, intro you both made, and uh, there wasn't a lot there I could disagree with, but, but I think you failed to mention one or two things, Mitch, in your intro, such as the renewed Cold War with Russia that we seem to see uh, evolving lately. So those were other things uh, that you mentioned that obviously people voted for or didn't realize they were voting for, but things like what's happening in Russia, the Afghanistan pullout with an announced date in advance, 
and a lot of other things that really affect us adversely as a nation and our, our national security is put in jeopardy because of decisions that are being made right now. I'm just not sure who's making those decisions. It, it's a great point you made, Tim. I mean, not only are we having problems at home, but our, our foreign policy has, has become a problem. You know, as the Jewish Republican Alliance, you know, one of our concerns are things that we're hearing about the new alignment with the Palestinians without any preconditions at all about recognizing Israel. And on uh, Palestinian TV in the last week, they made false accusations that the Israelis were murdering Palestinians and using the vaccine as hostage, when in reality, Israel has vaccinated Palestinian prisoners who wanted the vaccine, sometimes ahead of their own citizens. So yeah, yeah, feel free to talk about what you think is going on in our foreign policy right now, because we're all concerned. Yeah, well, th those are great points. Israel obviously is not only an important ally, but it's one of our closest friends. And we're one of Israel's closest allies. There's, there's a reason why that relationship has been so strong and was strengthened in the last administration, because in the administration prior, it was virtually ignored. And it, it appears that we're going back to that, I don't know what to call it, but an, an adversarial relationship with Israel rather than the friendship and the close ally they've been to us and we had been to them. And it's really sad to see. I mean, there's, there's no country in the Middle East that does more for people from outside its, its own citizenry than what Israel does. Israel gets the bad rap every time, and Israel is defending itself literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year from legitimate threats. And, and one of those greatest threats is not only a threat to Israel, but to the stable, stability of the Middle East and the world, and that's Iran. Yeah. And you look at what the Iranian regime is like and what they do, and yet we seem to have presidents and administrations that come and go that think that that's their greatest attribute is, is being able to reach out to a country like Iran that's run by a theocratic lunatic and has been for decades. And I don't blame the Iranian people. They're, they're great people. They're, there are bad people there too. But the, the, the vast majority of that population is no different than most populations in the world. They, they yearn for the same things people yearn for here in America, liberty, freedom, security, and they have none of that because of the administration they are stuck under. And it's just really sad to see that, you know, turning back to the Iran nuclear deal, when Iran clearly went against that deal, you know, yes, Donald Trump and his administration pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. Does that mean Iran and the rest of the people that signed that deal no longer have a deal? No. But did Iran stand by the terms of that deal? Not at all. And, and, you know, what Trump did pulling away from that, he didn't negate a treaty. It was never a treaty. It was never verified in any way or corroborated or looked at or even examined by the United States Senate, which has treaty powers. It was done by an administration that decided they were going to be the end all be all on what that international relationship should be. And I think it was a vast mistake. And I think we're seeing the fruits of that with uh, what happened this past week when the Iranians claim that the Israelis knocked out hundreds of centrifuges that were doing what? Those things don't make apple juice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, Tim, your, your background is truly remarkable. Um, you know, good point about what else people voted for, even if they didn't realize it, voting for the Cold War restarting. And you made a comment about whoever's making these decisions. If you had to speculate, I mean, I have my own thoughts, but uh, this guy, President Asterisk, he just seems to sign whatever people put in front of him. He seems to just go with the wind. Who do you think is calling the shots? Is it him or is is he literally just a puppet? I, it's it's so hard to say. I mean, I, 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 I'm not a fan of Joe Biden. I'm not a fan of Joe Biden because of his politics and the policies he pushes. Now, you guys, obviously, this is the Jewish Republican organization. I happen to be Catholic. I happen to go to church and believe in the teachings of my faith, and I follow them. I try to, at least. It seems like Joe Biden slaps the church in the face every time he talks about being Catholic because he is not Catholic in belief or practice. And so it's an affront to anybody that is. But that, that's, that's a personal thing. 
But what bothers me about what this administration is doing is that if you look at how many times Joe Biden has said, I'm not going to do this, and now he's doing that, or I'm going to do this, and now he's doing the opposite, it shows that either Joe Biden is a liar, or Joe Biden doesn't know what he believes in, or someone else is pushing the buttons right now. I understand there was a, a state visit uh, from, I think, the Japanese PM or somebody this morning at the White House who was greeted by the vice president, not the president himself. And I don't know what happened inside the White House doors after that, but it's pretty typical for a foreign leader to be greeted by their peer, not a lower level person, just from diplomatic standpoint. So I, I, I wish I could answer that question, Mitch. I don't know who can. Obviously, Joe Biden can. And maybe if there's a State of the Union in a couple of years, we'll hear from him. But the fact that we haven't heard from the President of the United States in a joint session of Congress and Senate to tell us what the state is of our union and what he intends to do to improve that state is mystifying. And they can use COVID as an excuse. They can use the threats from January 6th uh, rally that turned to a riot up on Capitol Hill as an excuse. But for six or eight weeks after January 6th, the Capitol was cordoned off with fences, concertina wire, and thousands of troops, armed troops. So security was clearly not an issue. No threat could have overcome that barrier that was put up around the people's house. And it's just sad that we haven't been able to get answers because he's not saying anything and nobody is asking him the questions. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, one of the things that frightens me uh, is what they're now trying to do with the Supreme Court. They're talking about packing the Supreme Court. FDR got into trouble for trying to do that. It opens up a door where the next administration or the next group that's in control will add even more. It undermines the Supreme Court. And Jerry Nadler, in his ability to try to manipulate language, says, we're not trying to pack the Supreme Court. We're unpacking the Supreme Court. I have no idea what that means. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, there's three branches of government in the United States. And sadly, most people have no concept of how civics works in the United States, how our government actually is structured. The Supreme Court is part of the checks and balances system. There are nine Supreme Court justices. That number has been determined by people way above my pay grade, way before I was born, but that's been the number. Now, can the president change it? Yeah, it's possible. They can do that. Why? Why would you want to? So the way the system is set up is that when a justice dies, the sitting president selects someone they would like to replace a justice, and the Senate has to confirm that person. That's been done. It was done three times under Donald Trump. Obviously, the Democrats are angry that it was done three times under Donald Trump, and they want to undo what the American people voted for nine years ago in bringing Donald Trump into the White House. Donald Trump, when he was running, very clearly stated who he wanted on the Supreme Court. He published a list of the people he said he would choose from if there were any Supreme Court openings. That was something Joe Biden refused to do when he was running for president. He did not name a single person he would consider for the Supreme Court. Why? I don't know. Has anybody asked him? I don't know. I haven't seen an answer to that. But the fact that this administration now wants to undo the prior administration. You can do that with, with regard to the bureaucracy and regulations. The president has that type of power with executive orders to change regulations of the uh, you know, interior ministry or things like that, or the interior department. But they don't have the authority to willy-nilly change who's on the Supreme Court. So what they want to do is say, oh, there's not enough justices on the court. We need to en enhance the number and put our justices in. And then as you just said, the problem is what happens if Donald Trump Jr. becomes president in 2024? Does the court go from 12 to 15? And then the next administration, it goes to 21? It's a ridiculous thing to start doing. And, and it's not needed, it's only wanted. It's like a temper tantrum after the fact that Donald Trump through an act of God, or whatever you want to call it, had to replace three justices during his term. And, and they knew, they knew what was coming because they 
had a chance to rule on this election and the Supreme Court refused to get involved knowing that that possibly could happen. So in some ways they're partially to blame. Yeah. And, and, you know, they, they, who knows what John Roberts does as the, as the, you know, leader of the Supreme Court, but I haven't been very impressed with him. Uh, it seems like uh, he, he was one thing at one time and has become another, but that's, we're stuck with that. And so unfortunately for, for us, that's jo what John Roberts has become. But fortunately, they at least take their role semi-seriously when they're facing cases. And I say semi-seriously because there's, there's certain times where you just scratch your head and say, what the heck was that all about? Decisions are made, but they're human beings. So they're not perfect. Um, we will never get 100% you know, conservatism from a conservative justice or 100% liberalism from a, a progressive justice. And that's probably a good thing. What we do see, though, is that they seem to get along. And they, though they come from opposite sides and they're, they're nominated by different administrations and different parties, the nine people that are together on Capitol Hill, behind the Capitol building, in that beautiful Supreme Court building, always seem to cooperate with each other. They can disagree vehemently, but they cooperate. And that's sadly what's missing from the rest of the population today. There is no cooperation. There's no understanding that there's another side. You don't hear Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she was alive saying that Ju Justice Antonin Scalia or, or Justice Clarence Thomas is a horrible, evil Nazi because of their beliefs and yet come out of that building and anywhere else in America, that's literally the discussion every single day. I shouldn't say discussion, it's the accusation every single day. And the problem is the American people have forgotten that there can be two sides to an issue and there might be right and wrong. Clearly there is right and left, but there can be right and wrong to issues too. And it's sad that we don't have any kind of open debate on anything, certainly not in the media, certainly not in the entertainment industry. and not in, in, in politics today. So it's, it's a, a sad state of events. And hopefully, hopefully the court doesn't get packed because there are a lot of people on the left and many and most on the right that are objecting to the possibility of that. But we'll see how it plays out. It'll be interesting to watch. Tim, uh, you know, I, I, am, um, I don't know who I'm more troubled by, President Asterisk or who's waiting in the wings for him to, to check out. Uh, she said she's going to go to Central America to see to the root of the problem. Well, the root of the problem is their administration. But what I want to ask you about the chaos of the border, it's horrible, it's terrible. They caused it. But I'd love to hear your angle about terrorism, like terrorists coming through disguised as uh, migrants escaping, uh, you know, their persecution. Yeah, it's a, it's a very real possibility. I mean, clearly it's happened in the past and it will happen in the future. Uh, the, the thing is that Islamic extremists, Islamic extremists, not just Muslims, Islamic extremists. They, they have a, a long game. It's a very long game. They don't look at winning today. They look at winning a thousand years from now. The 9-11 attacks were planned for five years or more before they conducted that attack. All the trial runs that the that the hijackers did, flying on those flights, getting to know the, the flight, the personnel, who was gonna be there trying to figure out a plan. They took years to plan what could have been planned in an hour and been as effective or more effective as a terrorist act. And thankfully it wasn't more effective, but despite that, they put a lot of planning into it. So they do not just do things on a whim. You know, there was, there was a, um, a famous plot that was planned for many years that ended up not taking place where they were going to blow up airliners over the Atlantic and kill thousands and thousands of people in the air. They were going to do it to multiple airliners so that nobody would be willing to fly anymore anywhere because they were going to plant these devices and just take planes out of the sky and kill everyone in them. And the problem is that we look at that enemy and we say, okay, we understand they don't like us. We understand that they want to do these terrible things. Maybe we can negotiate with them. Maybe we can understand them. And there is no understanding what's not understandable. We try and 
figure out, you know, when we see a, a shooter, we have a, a, you know, an active shooter that goes out and kills a bunch of people seemingly randomly. And then we try and make sense of it. And they say, what's the motive behind the shooting in Boulder, Colorado, a couple of weeks ago? Well, we can't make sense of what is by definition, a senseless act and terrorist acts are by their very nature senseless. They're intended to change political beliefs. They're intended to change political positions. They're intended to change populations and the government. But do they ever? Does our government after 9-11 say, oh, we understand now what Al-Qaeda wants and we're gonna change what we do? No, so when you think about it, it's a senseless act. It's senselessly killing thousands of people, inhumanely killing thousands of people. So the reaction to it is it makes us despise the enemy even more. So it's an opposite effect, effect of what the intention was. It's a senseless act, literally by definition. And so what won't they do if they're willing to A, die for their cause, B, kill as many people and create as much bloodshed as possible, and three, fail and try again and again and again? What won't they do? Will they cross our border illegally? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the 9-11 hijackers, they came to the United States, many of them on visas, student visas and other visas, and then they overstayed those visas. They were willing to break our laws. They risk that. Others came in short term. You look at Mohammed Atta, the ringleader. They came here. They took advantage of the systems that existed post 9-11. A lot of those things have been clamped down a little bit. It's harder now to do what they did. What's not harder? To come across the border when there are tens of thousands of people each and every day marching across deserts, crossing the Rio Grande, walking through open spaces that haven't been walled in or fenced in yet, and coming into the United States. We have no idea what the intentions of any of these people are. We know what their stated intentions are, or their perceived intentions. They're coming here for liberty, freedom, job opportunities, safety for their kids. That may very well be true for a lot of those people, but it's certainly not true for all of them. And apparently there was a couple of Yemeni guys that came across the border within the last couple of weeks, and there was an announcement about it, and then that re announcement was rescinded. And that leaves a little bit of a, a questionable taste in your mouth when you see that. Were they good? Were they bad? Who are they? Where are they now? Questions that need to be answered. Yeah, as President Trump said, if you don't control your border, you don't have a country. And so True. It, it was just a brief time ago. You're talking about 9-11, you know, to younger people. It's probably a long time ago to us. It was a blink in time when we were concerned about terrorists coming in. And now you open the border wide open and you can't even have a discussion on it or you're considered a racist. Uh, it's very concerning to me. Um, well, let, me, let me let me throw one more thing out there. Yeah. Now, think about what has affected you and I and everybody watching this since 9-11. Think about just TSA, what TSA has become. So I can't get it on an airplane with this. I can't enter an airport and go through security with a bottle of water because it's dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because there was a terrorist that got on a plane, had a binary explosive made of two liquids, put them together, to blow it up. That plot was uncovered. Thankfully, no explosion happened on a plane. No plane was taken down. But since then, I have to buy a bottled water in the airport. I can't bring it to the airport. So we strengthened some of our security measures in airports and other transit hubs around the world, especially within the United States. I travel internationally a, a fair amount. So I'm going into the Middle East. I'm going into Europe. I'm going to other places. And security is tight. You go through Great Britain, fly on British Airways internationally, your laptop is coming out of its bag. Everything, every electronic cord, everything's coming out. Everything's being examined. It is a very lengthy, detailed examination. That's great if we want to prevent terrorist acts. It's not great if we only do that to people that are flying to America. When they can walk in and, and carry, you know, like Acme nuclear bombs on their back <laughs> exactly. and, and drive a tractor trailer across the desert, what good is all that security that the TSA is doing when we leave a gaping hole in other places that all are part of that perimeter security around the United States? It doesn't make any sense.
No, it, it's very true. In fact, you know, I tell a story that right after 9-11, uh, my mother-in-law was out of the country and my father-in-law and I had to drive into uh, Mexico to pick her up because there were no flights coming in to the United States. And I commented going through, like going into Mexico at that point, people could have had missile silos on their shoulders. It could have went right in. It was an open border. Coming to the United States back though, they were looking at everything we we were doing. And yeah. now you have people coming from Mexico or from Central America or other places and they can come in. They don't need COVID tests. They can be released in our society. They can have what other weapons they have. And I think it's endangering Americans in the future. I would agree. And the, the problem is that you came in validly through a checkpoint. You came in at a regular border entry point. Yeah. Most of the people that are coming into the country across that border today aren't doing so. They're crossing the Rio Grande. They're crossing through the desert. They're putting themselves, their kids in terrible danger, dealing with coyotes who are basically cartel couriers. And they're being used as, as part of a flow of, of drugs, money, guns, and anything else that they want to bring in and move both directions across the border. They're also paying these people are paying for the privilege of being smuggled into the United States. And where does that money go? It's not building jobs and housing in, in Mexico or other countries in South, Central America. It's going to the cartels that, that run those operations. So we're benefiting one of our greatest and most evil enemies, the entities that are bringing drugs into this country to this, destroy the fabric of our society and our civilization and causing a tremendous amount of violence, both in the United States and in their home countries. And it's just, it's just inexplicable how people could look at that situation and think that it's helping anyone. Yes, there are some people that come here that migrate and, and find liberty and freedom here, and that's great. But you know what? There's a process for that. And that process shouldn't be ignored because without that process, or by going around that process, we put the entire country in jeopardy. And I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to live in a border town in Texas, Arizona, some of the other uh, states down there that are so adversely affected by this. You know, have ranchers, we have thousands of people coming and going, gunfights in their front yards every week. It's, it's a terrible situation. And the remedy is fairly simple. I just can't understand why people don't see it. At least we can sleep easily knowing that Kamala Harris is now in charge of our border. We can use it easily. Yep. And she's on it 24 seven, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim, uh, we have a very informed audience. They, they are uh, really heavily informed. Given your background with terrorism and counterterrorism, what's one of the more shocking or surprising things you can share with us that we would say we had no idea? Well, the, uh, there's, a, there's a lot I wish I could talk about, but a lot of what I uh, did was classified, obviously, because... Uh, the, the nature of the cases we were working. But one, one thing that I think a lot of people will be shocked about is how our allies support us. And one, you know, one of our allies, France, obviously, is a good ally, the UK, a lot of European countries are. But one thing that a lot of people don't realize is on 9-11, when we were attacked, the French, was the, they were the first forces to go after our enemies, Al-Qaeda, in Afghanistan. A lot of people don't know that the French deployed troops immediately to Afghanistan to look for Osama bin Laden and others that were part of the hierarchy of Al Qaeda at the time. And I worked very closely with a lot of entities, the French GIGN, which is uh, their domestic military and police counterterrorism. And it's a very elite military and police unit as well as the Commando Hubert, French Navy SEALs. And they were deployed. They went over there for America. And they were on the ground that day. So on 9-11, the first reaction force to what happened was actually people that are demeaned in jokes, you know, as being the, the people that wave a white flag. And I think that's the politicians have that reputation. But the, the actual operators, the military guys on the ground from France are some of the best and most fierce warriors in the world. They, they, their reputation um, precedes them in the places where they're most known in Africa, in the Middle East, 
but in America, they're the butt of jokes. And I have a lot of really good friends over there and I gotta, I gotta pay tribute to them and what they've done. And, and I would say, if your viewers want to learn a little bit about them, there was uh, there was an event that happened in 1994 in December, Christmas Eve. There was a hijacking of an Air France plane that ended up in Marseille, France. And the French GIGN stormed the plane and they did it with fairly primitive weapons and tools. They used the air stairs to assault the airplane and they use revolvers instead of semi-automatic handguns. And they were facing AK-47s and grenades. And there was a 22 minute gunfight. And there was a movie done called, I think it's called Les Assault, that was done by French uh, producers. And it's a pretty good reenactment of what happened. There is video online where you can see the actual gun battle, but, uh, or from a distance you see it, but this reenactment tells the heroism. And it's one of the most incredible stories of valor ever recorded in history. Um, the, the, to give you an example, the, the, the air stairs went up to three different doors of the plane. One went up to the front right door just behind the cockpit. Two went towards the rear of the plane. The team that went in the front right door immediately was facing the, the terrorists. Four terrorists, AK-47s, hand grenades. Every single one of those operators was shot going in the front there. They went in and they fought the terrorists that were in the cockpit. So the cockpit and where this line of uh, GIGN soldiers were was only about eight feet apart. And they formed a line side by side, shoulder to shoulder, holding on to each other while they were shooting at the terrorists and the terrorists were shooting at them so that the two teams that entered the rear doors could get all the passengers off the plane. Wow. And during that 22 minute gunfight, no passengers were injured in that. There had been other passengers injured and killed by the terrorists prior to the assault. But when the assault happened, they formed a wall, got all the passengers off, rescued the, the cockpit crew and killed the four terrorists. And I think 11 of the GIGN guys were injured. So I'm going off on a tangent, but, but that level of heroism, we see it in our own SEAL Team 6, Delta Force, and a lot of elite units, and even down in our low-level units. I have two sons that are Marines. And we see that, but we don't see with the France. So after 9-11, that afternoon, I got text messages and some emails from friends of mine in, in French special operations waving the American flag and telling us about the deployments that had taken place into Afghanistan to go after those that had come after us. So that's a little behind the scene things that I've never uh, heard told in the media before, but it's a story that I think needs to be told. They were heroes, they were true allies, and they were true friends of America. Well, thank you for sharing that story. You know, we've had so many thousands of young men and women who have gave their lives and risked their lives for freedom and, and the values that our country has always stood for, freedom of speech. And now, you know, most of our communication comes through Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Google, who are now are censoring and controlling what thoughts get out to people. I, I have a suspicion they very much interfered with the election. Uh, and now President Biden is, uh, blaming Russia for that, but I think uh, I'm more concerned about censorship. Even the head of uh, Pro Project Veritas, uh, James O'Keefe, was censored this week by Twitter. I think it's getting terrible. Yeah, and I think James O'Keefe was permanently banned from Twitter from what yeah. I read today. Yeah. And that is incredible. That's exactly what I was saying before about at least the Supreme Court, Court justices on opposite sides communicate there's one side of the debate that does not want it to be a debate. They are right. The other side is evil. It's not there's a right and a wrong or there's a maybe or there's any gray. That's it. It's black and white. We are right. We are good. The other side is evil. And how do you have a debate? How do you have any kind of discourse with that? You can't. And, you know, I think January 6th, as horrible as what happened on Capitol Hill, because I'm a former cop before I was an FBI agent, I was a street cop. I, I, my brothers and sisters in blue on that day were assaulted and attacked and they shouldn't have been. And I understand the anger that led to that. I understand how people could feel like they were never getting the truth. I understand why people fell victim to QAnon and, and entities like that, that were taking tidbits of truth and stretching them into these yarns and ridiculous tales. 
But there were questions that have not to this day been answered that led up to January 6th. And I'm not justifying the violence against the police on Capitol Hill or the attack on the Capitol itself. I'm not justifying that. It's unjustifiable what happened. Shouldn't have been done. The protest, the rally that day should have been done. Those things should always take place. I don't care if it's left or right. But to, to go from a rally where the president of the United States is speaking, other people are speaking, and there are hundreds of thousands of people watching, listening, dancing, praying, all the normal things that happen at protests, and then to see it evolve into what it evolved to. It evolved into what we saw all last summer and all last fall, and we're seeing again now. And I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of it in the coming weeks when some of the decisions come down in the Chauvin trial and, and other trials. And it's absolutely unjustifiable. The violence on January 6th is never justified. The violence in Minneapolis and in a host of other cities and towns, not justified. You can be angry, you can upset, be upset, you can be mad, that's fine. You're allowed to have those emotions. You're not allowed to burn down my business or loot your business because someone's upset. Yeah, it's justified that you're upset. We have political processes in place protest peacefully, and then affect those political processes. But the problem is you have one side that includes Twitter, TikTok, which just banned Prager, I understand today, um, and Facebook, which are all led by individuals who believe certain way and take those beliefs and then enforce what is technically not censorship. It's not censorship because it's not the government. But they act as the primary town square for discourse in America. And as such, they should be held to a standard which is above that which is their personal political belief. And when you see Facebook not only censoring information from getting out or YouTube, Google, or Twitter, censoring that information, there's no other word that applies even if the legal term of censorship doesn't apply, but they're censoring information from getting to people. And that censoring of the information means only one side of any debate exists. And so where's the nuance? Where's the possibility that, well, maybe Fauci is not the perfect human being we think he is. Maybe some of the information that's being promoted by the CDC, like all science, will later be realized and determined to have been wrong. We saw it in the medical practices after COVID. There were doctors that were being censored early on that were saying, hey, maybe putting somebody on an incubator right away, putting on intubating them and laying them on their back isn't the best thing. One doctor I know in New York was saying, let's turn them on their stomach, not intubate them, not put them on an incubator and just let them lay on their stomach so the fluid can drain out of their lungs. And that is now the common practice today. How many people died because it wasn't even considered early on. Yeah. How many people that died because of COVID didn't need to die? These are questions that are legitimate. Uh, the answer might be one. The answer might be 100,000. None of us know the answer because the question is not allowed to be asked in a public setting. It's not allowed to be asked in Congress, in the Senate, because the party that controls those two entities also controls Twitter, Google, and all these other groups and entities and private corporations that have a belief and a narrow set of, of things that they need to say and they want to say and anything outside that can't be said. And it's terrifying. It's I don't care which side. If Donald Trump was doing it, I would hate Donald Trump for doing it. The fact that the, the left is doing it now is not, it's not, this isn't partisan politics. I don't want anybody to do that. There should be open dialogue. There should always be debate because until you allow every side to be heard, no logical and reasonable decision can be made, first of all. And there's no way to combat the wrong that's being broadcast. You know, having a CNN out there saying one thing and, and what Project Veritas released this week, apparently, you know, very pushing propaganda fine, let them do that. I have no problem with CNN doing that. I've been on CNN. I was on CNN yesterday. 
I try and push truth when I'm on CNN. I don't deny that they're on one side and I'm on the other side. So what? I want to engage in a debate with them. I want there to be back and forth. And there isn't any. I, on Fox News, you have, you have, you know, Juan Williams. Juan Williams and I agree on 3% of politics. But I, I watch him and there's others like him that are on Fox News. So there is at least some back and forth there. But the MSNBCs, the CNN, the NBC, the C CBS, all of these entities, they, they put the blinders on and say, oh, we're going to only promote this. We're only going to push this. We're going to propagandize these things. And that's not good. We need to be open to debate, debate those that disagree. And like Mitch said in his opening statement, you never know. Some people are going to con be convinced to go left. Other people will be convinced to go right. But at least if you have dialogue, there's going to be a reason for that. If you go left or you go right because you're in an echo chamber, you're not doing anybody any good. We don't need to preach to the choir. We need to preach to the heathens in the world and get them to join the choir. That's right. Uh, Tim, I, I gave a speech a few weeks ago about the importance of the Second Amendment and the, the wisdom of the founding fathers coming up with it. If you could delve a little deeper about not just Second Amendment, but the concealed carry weapon, the CCW, like why is that for people who are not into guns and don't care about that kind of thing? Because there's another mass shooting that happened yesterday. Uh, wh wh why do you think the CCW or even states have open carry? Why is that good for society? Why is that important? I, I don't remember who said it, uh, but somebody once said an armed society is a polite society. So you, you can be anywhere at any time and having the ability to defend yourself reduces your fear level. I don't care who you are. I never go anywhere without a gun. I carry a gun every day I have for decades and I always will. I, I'm allowed to carry in all 50 states and I do. And that's a great benefit. But why, it, why am I only allowed that? Yes, I have a couple of decades of law enforcement training, SWAT, firearms instructor, everything else, expert marksman. That's not required by the constitution. That's not what the constitution says. You always have, you know, Joe Biden talking about, we're not going to take away your shotguns. I don't care. You can have your shotgun. I don't want a shotgun. I have plenty of them and I never liked them. <laughs> but the second amendment is about the people being able to protect themselves and their way of life, including against their own government. That's the reality because the amendments to the United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights, are not about determining the people's power. It's about delineating the limits of the government's power. So what does the First Amendment say? Religion, the press, speech. It says, government, don't touch those. And then right after that, it says, because the people have the right to keep and bear arms. That's how you keep the government from touching those. Look at all of those, the right to be secure in your person, in your house, you know, the fourth amendment, all of the different things that the amendments bring up, the bill of rights bring up are limits on government power. They're limits on the government and their freedoms declared about what the people have. They're declared about the people. They're not dictated to the people. It literally says, these come from God. They don't come from the government. But we create the government and we are dictating what the government can and cannot do. And that's a great thing. And constitutional carry, which is, I think it's in 17 or 18 states, Texas House just passed a bill yesterday, apparently, that's going to move on to the, the higher legislature and to the governor, hopefully, where they may have constitutional carry there. Montana and Tennessee just passed it within the last few weeks. And what is that? Constitution carry just says the Constitution gives you the right to keep and bear arms. Therefore, who are we to limit your right to keep and bear arms? It's basically what a governor says. That's what a state says when they pass that. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, there are crazy people in the world. You look at all of these active shooters. None of them are sane individuals. So if we ban all guns, will those insane individuals be able to harm us? Nice, France, a truck is driven into a crowd on Bastille Day, I believe, and 87 people die. Were there any weapons there? Is a truck a weapon? No. Are we going to curtail your right to own or drive a truck because some lunatic did what he did in Nice, France, and later happened in New York on the Lower East Side? 
the same thing. A truck, I think it was around 4th of July or something, some event, drove a truck or a car into a crowd of people, several were killed. So it's not the tool. The tool isn't the problem. So banning a particular tool does nothing to make us safer. It only makes us more vulnerable to those same threats and to threats by our government or outside entities. And so the Second Amendment is there. I don't care about hunting. I don't hunt. I'm glad people do. My son likes to hunt. Good for him. He loves elk. He's going to go elk hunting in Montana next year. That's great. That's not what the Second Amendment is about. It has nothing to do with that. The right to the, of the people to keep and bear arms not being infringed has to do with your own defense, defense of your loved ones, defense of your country. And that's a defense against criminals, terrorists, or your government, all of the above. And so if you're going to say to me, Tim, I have to take your gun away because that crazy guy just killed a bunch of people in a grocery store. I'm going to say, okay, let's think about this logically. All right. There are rapists out there. And I would say probably better than 99.9% .9 of rapists use their penis to rape people. And I'm sorry to be vulgar if this is vulgar, but does that mean I have to give up my penis because they're using theirs <laughs> for crimes? I mean, what sense does this make? It doesn't make any sense at all. Yes, some people do bad things. Stop the people that are doing the bad things. Punish them. Don't make me vulnerable. Don't take away my gun or my private parts because I intend to keep them and use them. The Constitution provides me the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and both of those things provide me that. Take them away, and somebody else isn't any safer. Somebody is actually in more danger because you've taken away my gun. Because if you take away my gun, I can no longer act to protect others. And have I used my gun to protect others? Many, many times as a cop, as an FBI agent, and as a citizen. And most of those times, the gun was never fired. And that's the thing that, that the that gun control crowd never looks at, the statistics. How many hundreds of thousands or millions of times a year a gun is used defensively most of the time without ever being fired. Because the presence of a gun, it's known as the great equalizer for a reason. An adversarial force meets another force that they think is weaker. That's why the adversarial force would attack because they think they have something on a weaker force. That could be a five foot tall, 90 pound woman, like one of my daughters. And that woman presents a 357 Magnum, like one of my daughters. That adversarial force now is meeting something different than what they thought. They were looking down at that force and now they're looking up and they're looking in what looks like the Lincoln Tunnel because the barrel of a gun, when you're staring down it, gets bigger and bigger and bigger before you because now you have a legitimate threat. So if a woman is about to be attacked and she draws a gun and says, I will shoot you and the attacker backs away, that statistic is rarely kept except by John Lott, who's a, a Second Amendment proponent and does a lot of research on this. And he looks at these cases. The NRA looks at some of these cases and they publish them every month, at least a handful of them. And if we look at that, we realize, look, the bad people doing bad things, literally, that will never end. The tools they choose to use to do that, they're vast and varied. Gasoline can be used. You know, a, as, as I said, a vehicle can be used. Almost anything can be used. Cinder blocks have been used to kill people in robberies. It's terrible. It's horrible. But to blame one inanimate object and think that if I ban this object, all of a sudden evil goes away and violence ends is a ridiculous, idiotic, childish way of thinking. It does not happen. It will not happen. It has not happened anywhere it's tried. The UK has knifings and glassings at an astronomical number every year because they took away a lot of the guns. They didn't take away the evil and they didn't take away the violence. So they still have violence in their society. We all saw the bloody scene a few years ago where a young British soldier walking down the street was attacked by two Islamic extremists in the UK in broad daylight with machete and butcher knives and a meat cleaver. And they were bragging about it. People were videotaping and they were bragging about what they just did with the warm dripping blood on their hands. 
Does banning guns in the UK stop violence? No. It stopped them from using a gun, and instead they committed one of the most heinous murders ever witnessed using knives. How do we stop that behavior? You raise such amazing points. I'm so glad that you spoke up about that. Great question, Mitch, that you asked. Um, when I was younger, the big fear, every generation has their fears, right? The big fear was nuclear war with the Soviet Union. I mean, we, I remember being in elementary school and we had to have special evacuation yeah. plans and hiding under our desks. I never figured out how that was going to help us. But um, now Ronald Reagan calls the, the Soviet Union the evil empire. He leads us and we win the Cold War. Back in the day, the people on the left were against the Cold War, thinking that we should capitulate to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan disagreed with that. We won the Cold War. And now there's no more Soviet Union. And one of our viewers, David L, asked the question, well, there's no more Soviet Union. Um, why? And the, and the Democrats didn't want the Cold War now. What's going on now that they're trying to revive the Cold War with Russia by opening up sanctions and ignoring China? Yeah, I, I wish I could answer that. I mean, the threat of nuclear war has never subsided. It didn't disappear it may be reduced a little bit. And did it subside? No, because Russia didn't eliminate all of their nuclear weapons when the Soviet Union broke up. They took most of them from the Eastern European countries and they had may, went many more than they could have ever used. I don't know the state of their, the current state of their stockpile, but uh, it was a pretty substantial number. And our stockpile has been reduced somewhat, but we still have a fairly substantial number. But now we have other countries that are nuclear powers that make that threat continuous. And China obviously is one of them. China's nuclear program is, is fairly vast. North Korea is in, in that house now. Iran is trying to get into that same house and the North, North Koreans, the Chinese and the Russians apparently are willing to help them. So what other countries are threats that we have to worry about? Probably several, but the, the big ones are, look at the border, Iran and Pakistan, what's happened there? nuclear threat continues and a nuclear war kicks off anywhere it pretty much kicks off everywhere because there there's going to be intervention from multiple sides and then who who chooses what side they're on and what happens when you know if we come to the side of pakistan against india or india against pakistan what does russia do which side are they on what does china do what side are they on so it's still a real threat and the, the left, unfortunately, doesn't ever see threats as legitimate, ex except the ones in their minds. You know, they saw Donald threat as the greatest threat to, to civilization on the planet and how he was going to start all these wars. And yet, there was pretty much just peace. Not only didn't he start any new wars, but he was pulling us out of old ones. He was also doing the Abrahamic Accords with Israel in the Middle East. And that was something that nobody knew was happening behind the scenes, or at least it wasn't publicized. And maybe it wasn't publicized because they didn't want to give Trump any credit for at least trying. But then he succeeded one country after another country after another. And that's, that's a huge deal, because if you can bring peace to the Middle East, if you can truly bring peace there, like has been done now with all these countries, then the, the tensions subside greatly. And now you have more people coming to the table to deal with issues like uh, Iran, Russia, and China, because then it's just not the United States alone. It's the United States and the UAE and maybe Saudi Arabia and Israel together, all of us talking about the threat of Iran or the threat in Russia or the threat in China. And so that level of diplomacy now gets enhanced greatly because they're not sitting at the table pointing fingers at each other. They're sitting at the table pointing fingers at mutual enemies, which is a great thing. And I don't understand why we want to get into another Cold War with Russia. Look at the, the Crimea situation right now, Russia amassing all those troops on the border, moving tanks and personnel there. For what purpose? Exercises? Yeah, doubtful. It's, it's they're preparing to invade all of Ukraine or take Crimea and territories around it to develop, uh, you know, 
a larger area or an envelope of protection around what they consider their territory in Crimea. And so that situation, rather than sitting at the table and maybe discussing the situation and trying to bring reason, instead we're, we're pulling out, we're accusing the leadership, Putin, of, of you know, I, I don't know what Biden said a couple of weeks ago, but I think he called him a murderer or killer. a killer. Yeah, that that's not diplomacy. Yes, Ronald Reagan did talk about the axis of evil or, or George Bush talked about the axis of evil and Ronald Reagan talked about about our enemies and the, you know, tear down this wall. He he directly confronted it, but there was still diplomacy going on. There was a lot of work going on and that was a truly evil empire, the Soviet Union, and what they had done over a, a, a 75 years or more was incredible, the, the number of lives in the wake of the Soviet Union. And so that enemy needed to be faced, and it was faced. But the Russians right now, we're not at war with the Russians. They're not, you know, and you don't, you don't have Stalin slaughtering hundreds of thousands or millions and hundreds of millions of people. So there's room for negotiation, there's room for debate, and we're not doing it for some reason. So I don't know, I, you know, you asked earlier, who's making the decisions? I, I, I'm not sure there is anybody making decisions, maybe they're just flipping coins. Well, Tim, I wanted to, on behalf of the JRA, thank you for coming on our show. Uh, you've been an excellent guest, you're welcome back anytime. Thank and uh, I know Tracy has posted some links in the chat, uh, some of your recent articles uh, about your, you and your brother, Jim, with America's Most Wanted taking over that show. Um, we wish you the very best of success and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It was great chatting with you. Well, thank you. And well, thank you all everyone for being here as well. Uh, we're going to have a no show next week on the 23rd, but on April 30th, we're gonna be hosting Burgess Owens uh, so that should be an exciting and, and great show for everybody. Um, so what you can do in the meantime is what we always say, get involved, stay informed, and make a difference. And we need your participation. Tell others about us. And until we meet again, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk soon.